Rhyming Dialogue 5 Hi. Hi. Let's try this again. We made it to five. Do you think we'll make it to ten? I don't know. Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves just yet. Okay, we have a ways to go before we reach that word net. Speaking of word nets, I wanted to discuss word salads with you. That's funny. I was just thinking about word salads, too. Since we are constraining ourselves to timing and rhyming, I think sometimes we are confusing more than refining. Yes, I agree that in some instances that may be the case. To try to make this impeccable within those constraints would feel like an impossible race. I think it's better to put it out there, word salads and all, rather than refine and refine until the whole thing becomes a big stall. Anytime something is explored, there will always be more. What we're doing here isn't exhaustive research, it's more like lore. Which isn't to say that it's okay to be sloppy. I don't think we're trying to build something that is a total jalopy. I agree. So let's see if we can clarify a few past word salad mixes before we toss any new word salad dishes. Okay, here's one chickpea that's been bothering me. Claiming that doubt is the fundamental non-interventionist causative deserves more of an expositive. Yeah, first of all, that was quite a claim, and second of all, I think it's lame. Oh, how so? I think of doubt as a suspension of judgment or lack of certainty. How can a suspension of or lack of something cause anything fundamentally? Suspending food consumption will cause hunger or cause loss of weight. Lacking oxygen to breathe will cause death or cause lungs to aspirate. Suspending a body upside down will cause excess blood flow to the head. Baked dough that lacks yeast will cause unleavened flatbread. Well, okay, when you put it that way. That last one was a little iffy. Let me try to come up with some replacements in a jiffy. Lack of information may cause inquiry, curiosity, or fear. Lack of imperfection and distortion will cause glass to be crystal clear. Okay, okay, I get it. Your examples are so non-interventionist. I think of doubt as omni-onymous with awe and wonder, linked in a kind of triad cluster. I thought we were trying to avoid confusion, and you're tossing brand new words into the profusion. Well, sometimes a new word is needed for the idea to be completed. Herbivorous and carnivorous, and maybe piscivorous and insectivorous, are too omnivorous as synonymous and antonymous and maybe eponymous and anonymous are to omnionymous. Oh boy, you're really on a roll. Not just word salads, but word antipasto. When you say awe and wonder are omnionyms of doubt, what are you talking about? Do you mean that they all go together in the same category, set, or order? Yes, that's almost what I meant. More so, I meant that they share higher-order universal meaning content. Meaning derived from those three concepts is understood from the same edifice, axiology, as an omnivore consumes all different foods through the same orifice, gastroenterology. I think we're getting off track. Please try to bring us back. Okay, I also claimed doubt is the neutral between positive and negative. Tying it together, I think awe and wonder are also neutrals between negative and positive. Think of what it's like to experience that triad. To be in a state of awe is to be in between fixation and dread. To be in a state of wonder is to be in between ignorance and discovery. To be in a state of doubt is to be between I agree and I disagree. That place in between is a conceptive, creative scene a fundamentally non-interventionist causative mean. Okay, keep going. Think of other neutrals in the electric universe. How do they work and disperse? Good question. Lead me through the progression. In electricity, neutral is the circuit that leads back to source. Within the nuclei of atoms, neutrons act as a binding force. 
Outside of atoms and on their own, neutrons act like wild, irradiating sparks. When neutron stars merge, heavy elements emerge and space-time torques. That seems pretty creative and causative for things that are inherently neither negative nor positive. I feel satisfied that you've had the opportunity to add some dressing to your claims of importunity. Okay, what words shall we toss in next? Or have you had enough of these word salad projects? Here's a cucumber I'd like to plunder. In the first dialogue, you implied that subjective beliefs have no effect on objective reality. Then, in the third dialogue, you talked about panpsychism, mind, and telepathy. On one hand, you seem to be saying that what a mind believes about the outside world has no effect on the outside world. It only affects the believer's view of the world. On the other hand, you seem to be saying mind is pervasive and intrinsic to all, and that something like telepathy or telekinesis might be possible. They seem sort of contradictory. How do you reconcile those? Well, I don't, I suppose. Will you help me to understand that seeming sleight of hand? Yes, will do. Which is false and which is true? A contradiction is to make a claim that is both true and false at the same time. Or to claim impossible inherent qualities, like saying there are equal inequalities, or round squares, or going up to get downstairs. Do you agree with me? Yes, I agree about contradiction. Now explain the friction. The answer is complicated. First, understand that it is possible to hold, argue, discuss, and or debate contradictory ideas, whereas a person would likely fold if they try to believe contradictory ideas. Let me try to demonstrate. It's possible for me to observe or imagine a thing or entity or idea or state as such that what is contradictory at one level of examination is no longer contradictory at a different level of dilation. It's not possible for a square to be round or for a cube to be a sphere in a single instance, but a square can become round and a cube can become a sphere through a time distance. Picture a two-dimensional square morphing into a circle, Picture a three-dimensional cube morphing into a marble. Now count those morphs as causal instances, and you have seemingly not-so-contradictory animated images. Are you saying that as long as you can use different levels of circumspect to scan, that there are no restrictions, no contradictions? Well, no. That's what's interesting about awareness's stations. We can also lock on to singular immovable object or idea identifications. We can say, look, there's a dog, or that's a beach ball. In that instance, there's a kind of intrinsic fall, as if that dog or that ball existed as a singular separate entity from the surrounding interconnected matrix of reality. Well, yes, it's similar to the blind spot issue. We are able to do a kind of awareness-focusing jujitsu. We can either go narrow in between or go wide to extrapolate things from every different side. Right, and is there ever any kind of end to that process? Is it possible to reach any definitive ends or conclusions or contradictions in that sense? This might be why the theorized beginning or end describes a bang, crunch, or bounce, because what it ascribes is the iterative, reflective, morphing nature of awareness, bouncing, banging, and crunching between otherness and selfness. Yeah, it's a never-ending loop of projection and identification. This is where and when learning takes place and fills every possible time and space. Sometimes we generalize and sometimes we specialize. To some things we connect, to other things we disconnect. Sometimes we interrelate and sometimes we separate. Sometimes we serve others and sometimes we serve ourselves. Sometimes things appear to be parts of wholes or just in and of themselves. If there was no dynamic, all would be static. If there was lack of opposition, all would be in one position. If there were no movement, all would be still. If there were no choice, there would be no will. 
Right. Sometimes we make a representation of the actual, which appears contradictory or counterfactual, because we're not taking into consideration, with that representation, all of the dynamic force underlying that source. Almost like everything in and of itself intrinsically, as if in and of itself were even a possibility, would have to possess an iterative parenthetical which extended to a universal scale exegetical. Did you want to toss in anything else about mind before this word salad is fully combined? As humans, we experience that interactive, dynamic, bouncing perspective. We sense the universe through this tribal, oppositional, parenthetical respective. However, a rock just might have a mind for apprehending the static, the stillness, the represented, the lack of opposition, the achromatic. I know how it can be both awe-inspiring and awful to have a mind like mine. Imagine what it would be like to have a mind of a snail, or a mushroom, or slime. A quark, a crystal, a cloud, a barroom, a battle, or a galaxy. A dog, a beach ball, an alien, a castle, an art, or a calamity. This has been more word salad than we'll ever be able to digest. Let's call it a day and give it a rest. Ah, oh, but it's so fun, and I'm not getting any chores done. Take some time to let your mind unwind and rewind. Are you sure you don't want to throw in some croutons and cheese? Yes, there's plenty here already to appease. Let's say goodbye. Okay, bye.